Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us tonight for our ongoing study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we are back to our study of the book of Numbers. And we want to invite you then to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 16. We'll be looking at Numbers 16 and 17 tonight. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's something that we need to be praying about as a church, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, uh, we want to hear about that and we invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message, info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you could call or send a text to 608 224 0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we want to look at Numbers 16 and 17, and we're slowing down just a little bit tonight, only covering two chapters because we're coming to a rather significant event. I know we've talked about the sin of whining several times already in the book of Numbers. God has killed more people for the sin of whining than for just about any other sin. If you have a difference of opinion on that, let me know. I'd love to hear about that if I've missed something. But I think we'll see yet another example of this in these two chapters that we'll be looking at tonight. So let's jump right into it tonight with Numbers chapter 16, Numbers 16 verses 1, 2, and 3. Numbers 16, 1 through 3. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves among the assembly of the Lord? Up in verse 1, we're introduced to Korah. And most of you know that I'm not too good at figuring out family relationships, anything beyond mom, dad, brother, sister. Uh, but if I've understood this correctly, this guy is a great, grandson of Levi. And so I just want to say this guy is an insider. He is a Levite. He is from the priestly tribe. And so he is in some sense a religious leader. At least he's a part of the family. And so this man should have known better. And then let's also notice that he is joined by two other men, Eli Eliab and On, the grandsons of Reuben. And at the end of verse 1, it says that they took action. So these men got together and they did something. They rose up together before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, a grand total of about 250 leaders. Now, before we even get to what happens next, I just want to ask, how do 250 men rise up before Moses simultaneously? How does that happen? How does that actually go down? And as I think about that, I have to assume that somebody organized that. These guys didn't just wake up at the same time and just happen to get together thinking the same thing, but somebody had to go out and had to start rallying people toward this cause. So this was, as I understand it then, a campaign of some kind. Somebody, probably Cora himself, since he's listed first here, had to go to somebody else and start mumbling and grumbling about Moses. And then Cora and whoever he complained to, those perhaps would have then turned around and they would have talked to somebody else behind the scenes. And then these people would have talked to other people and those people would have talked to people. And they're gossiping and they're slandering and they're whining to one another and this builds on itself. And before long, there is this full-blown rebellion that we're talking about right here. And I'm just saying that when 250 men rise up together before Moses at the same time, that's what we know. But we also know that there's a whole lot that had to happen before it ever got to that point. And I think that's a part of the problem here. That's what God's going to address going forward. So these leaders then, they rise up and they assemble together against Moses and Aaron. They come pretty close to making the same mistake uh, Aaron and Miriam made just a few chapters ago. Basically, they say, you've gone far enough. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So these leaders then are clearly upset that they are not leaders. I hope that's pretty obvious here. I think that it is. It looks to me as if they're jealous, that they want the power that Moses and Aaron have been given by God. And in a sense, this uh, statement is somewhat true. Yes, there is a sense in which all the people are holy. This is what they approach Moses with. We're all holy, just like you are. 
However, I think we also need to realize that just because someone is holy does not mean that God has put them in a position of leadership. And so they are twisting this. They're not getting the full picture here. The other issue here is that they are assigning blame to Moses and Aaron for exalting themselves above the assembly of the Lord. You know, we've already learned, though, that this is completely backwards, isn't it? Uh, Moses did not go looking for his leadership position. Instead, Moses did everything in his power to avoid it, didn't he? Uh, we go back to Exodus, I think chapters 3 and 4, if I remember correctly, where he just gives one excuse after another why he does not want to do this. And so Moses certainly did not go looking for this leadership position, but instead Moses is serving at God's command. Uh, God practically had to twist his arm into taking this position. And so when we think about it in that way, then the people, they're not really complaining to Moses, are they? I mean, he's the kind of physical manifestation. He's taking the heat for this, but they're actually complaining to God, although they don't realize it quite yet at this point. So let's continue by looking at Numbers 16, verses 4 through 11. The next couple paragraphs kind of go together. So Numbers 16, verses 4 through 11. When Moses heard this, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this. Take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them, and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that the Lord of Israel, that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself? to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and minister to them, and that he has brought you near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Up in verse 4, Moses is devastated, isn't he? He falls on his face. He's overwhelmed with this, really not knowing perhaps uh, what to do or just overwhelmed with the gravity of all of it. And he addresses Korah and these other leaders and he, and he puts this back on the Lord by suggesting a test. You guys take censers for yourselves, kind of fire pans, and try burning incense on those censers in the presence of the Lord tomorrow morning. Let's just see what happens. We're going to kind of do this. And remember, only certain people were allowed to actually offer incense like that. They had to be appointed to that role. And so if you want to be leaders, try being leaders and just uh, give it a shot and see how that works out for you. That's kind of the way I'm taking this. So starting in verse 8, Moses turns his attention to the others. And he's making the point that they as Levites are already in a position of tremendous privilege. You're already... Uh, serving the people, you are already above the other people in a sense. So why risk that privilege by forcing themselves into the actual priesthood? Is it worth it? Because Moses explains they are really not protesting against Moses, but they've actually gathered together against the Lord. And that's not a position we want to be in. And then at the end, oh, by the way, leave my brother Aaron out of this. You know, Aaron has done nothing worthy of being grumbled against either. So, you know, not only are you grumbling against the Lord, but you really have no beef with Aaron, even though you think that you do. Well, let's continue by looking at number 16, verses 12 through 19. The next uh, little section here, number 16, 12 through 19. Then Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord it over us? Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, Do not regard their offering. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done any harm to any of them. Moses said to Korah, you and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. 
So they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it, and they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. So in that previous paragraph, Moses addresses Korah. Now Moses calls for Dathan and Abiram, the other two leaders of this rebellion so that he can maybe chew them out a little bit. So he's going to talk to them just as he talked to Korah. But notice in this opening paragraph here, they refuse. And if I could paraphrase, you're not our boss. You can't tell us what to do. You know, not only did you drag us out here to die in the wilderness, but now you want to boss us around? Uh, we don't think so. And so as they see it, Moses just wants to gouge out their eyes, which is absolutely ridiculous when you think of it. Moses has nothing at all like that on his mind. And so Moses gets angry. And, you know, there are times when Moses seems to lose his temper almost uh, inappropriately, like the time he killed the Egyptian kind of before his time. He saw the abuse taking place. He stepped in, went maybe a little bit too far. But this is not one of those times. I want us to notice here, this time Moses had a pretty good reason to be angry, doesn't he? And I would suggest that in this case, he handles it pretty well by going to the Lord. So he doesn't retaliate against these men, but he takes this concern to the Lord and Moses pretty much tells the Lord, do not accept their offering tomorrow, which is interesting. God can accept whatever offering he wants to, but this is Moses' advice to the Lord. Uh, Lord, we're setting up a test here. Please don't, uh, you know, don't fall for their, uh, their story here. So Moses then gives the reminder, everybody show up tomorrow. You want to be leaders? Lead by offering incense, and uh, let's allow God to settle this, which is uh, pretty good advice. This uh, seems to be a wise plan, because I think Moses knows, uh, at least has some clue as to what's about to happen. Well, this brings us kind of to the brink of the showdown. The men show up, uh, they come together with their fire pans, they are standing at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and right at the very last uh, verse or two there, God actually shows up for this showdown. So let's pick up then with number 16, verses 20 through 35. Kind of a larger section, but uh, uh, kind of an exciting narrative here. I hate to uh, chop it right in half. So we're just going to read straight through this. Number 16, verses 20 through 35. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him, and he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Moses said, By this you shall know, that the Lord has sent me to do these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Up in verse 20, God wants Moses and Aaron to step back so that he can kill everybody and start all over again. They beg God, though, and God reconsiders. Once again, Moses and Aaron intercede. This is what they've been called to do, and they do it. God now wants everybody to back away from the tents of Korah and Dathan and Abiram, the ringleaders of this rebellion. And so God is making the people choose, isn't he? Whose side are you on? you got to go one way or another here. Either stand with those men or step away. If you listen to Moses, back up. 
But if you side with these three men, then ignore the warnings that are coming here through Moses. Thankfully, the people listen. They back away. The three ringleaders, though, come out and they stand at the doorway to their tents. And they're there with their families, even their little children. So they've made a choice for their own families and their families follow after them. And now that everybody has made their decision, Moses makes the announcement. If these men die of old age someday, then I'm not God's appointed leader. However, if something happens here today that's never happened before, for example, if the earth would have swallowed these people alive, then you'll know that these men have offended the Lord through their rebellion. And I know this is a larger chunk of scripture than most of our studies, but I think it all goes together because I want us to notice here there is no delay. In fact, I would say there is almost uh, less than a delay. There's no... Uh, there's no straight from one to the other. There's almost a little bit of overlap here. As Moses finished speaking these words, the ground under these men splits open and swallows the men and their families and everything they own. And they are buried alive. And I also want us to notice that they are screaming as they go uh, because of what comes next. Because at this point, everybody nearby runs for their lives. Uh, they hear the screaming. They don't want that to happen to them. They're worried the earth may swallow them up as well. And then notice fire comes down and consumes the 250 men at the same time. Um, so these men then definitely did not die of old age, did they? So that was Moses' distinction. If they go the way that everybody goes, that's one thing. But if they die in some new and improved, unique way, then you'll know that I'm God's spokesman. So this is something new. God has spoken, uh, indicating that Moses is indeed his appointed leader. And then also making the point that to complain against Moses was to complain against God himself. That's a lesson these people really need to learn. So let's uh, pick up with the next paragraph, number 16, verses 36 through 40. Number 16, 36 through 40. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blades, for they are holy, and you scatter the burning coals abroad. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered sheets for a plating of the altar, since they did present them before the Lord, and they are holy, and they shall be, a, be for a sign to the sons of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers which the men who were burned had offered, and they hammered them out as a plating for the offer, as altar, as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who is not of the descendants of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord, so that he will not become like Korah and his company, just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. So now we come to the cleanup of this mess, we might say. Since the fire pans have been used in worship, they're holy. So God has Eleazar go recover these fire pans from the smoking rubble. And these fire pans are to then be rescued. They are to be reshaped into plating for the altar as a sign, as a reminder. And so going forward, whenever the people would come to offer sacrifices in the tabernacle, they would see those fire pans serving as a covering over the altar. And they would hopefully remember what happened on that day. And I would like to think that fathers would uh, teach their uh, children about this as they take their offering to the altar. Look, you know, you see this covering. That's because of these guys who, who whined in the wilderness and they were destroyed. But we rescued the pans and this is for us to remember. And uh, hopefully they would take it as a lesson. Do not whine and complain against God's appointed leadership. I think that's kind of really the, the rock-solid summary of this entire chapter. All right, let's continue then with number 16, verses 41 through 50. Number 16, 41 through 50, the next paragraph here. But on the next day, the congregation, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, You are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. It came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tent of meeting. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Then they fell on their faces. Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put fire in it from the altar and lay incense on it, then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord, the plague has begun. 
Then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken and ran into the midst of the assembly, for behold, the plague had begun among the people. So he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. He took his stand between the dead and the living, so that the plague was checked. But those who died by the plague were 14,700, besides all those who died on account of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meeting, for the plague had been checked. We might have hoped that the people would have learned something from watching Korah and the other rebels getting swallowed by the earth screaming and watching the 250 co-conspirators getting burned to a crisp instantly before the Lord and the congregation, but no. The very next morning, the people start whining and complaining that Moses had caused those people to die. And so they blame it on Moses. And I would say today also, when church discipline has to take place, a lot of times people who may not know the whole story would blame it on the leadership. Well, you just whacked those guys too quickly. You didn't give them a chance, that kind of thing. It's very easy to take hold. And notice once again, when this happens, God prepares to kill everybody. I'm starting over. But again, Moses once again steps in. He has Aaron prepare an offering of incense at the Lord's direction, which he does. And the offering stops the plague. And let's notice how it stops the plague. As people are falling dead, Aaron has to go run right in there. He can see this wave of death going through two to three million people. And so he sees people dropping like flies and he goes and he stands right between the dead and the living with this offering of incense to the Lord. And that's how the plague is stopped but not before 14,700 people die. That right there is a huge figure. I looked it up online this week and I just kind of asked Google um, the population of all the communities in Dane County and it popped up right away, gave me kind of a, in descending order of the number of people in each city, town and village. And I kind of scrolled down there to around 14,700 and that is basically the population of Wanakee. So if you can imagine Wanakee and all of the people, all the citizens of that little town dying, that's about the same number that we're dealing with here. Also, very roughly, the population of Verona or Stoughton. So just to put this in terms that we can understand, that's a lot of people. So interceding for rebellious people is kind of getting to be a full-time job now, isn't it, for Moses and Aaron? They're kind of getting familiar with this. And this cannot continue. So I think what the people need next is an object lesson. So let's continue into the next chapter with number 17, 1 through 7. Number 17, 1 through 7. This will be the last chapter that we study tonight. Number 17, 1 through 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household, 12 rods from all their leaders, according to their father's households. You shall write each name on his rod and write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, for there is one rod for the head of each of their father's households. You shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. It will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders gave them a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's households, 12 rods with the rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. To try to settle this issue once again concerning who is the uh, two is to lead the people, notice God arranges a very uh, dramatic demonstration of this. They are to take a, a rod, a walking staff, a shepherd's staff, one from each tribe. They are to mark these, and they are then to put these rods in the tent of meeting overnight to see what happens. And God says he's going to cause one of those rods to sprout. Uh, which is from the man who is supposed to be leading. And apparently this is supposed to calm things down. And uh, so this is what they do. They follow the Lord's instructions here. Let me get rid of the battery warning. I'm assuming you guys can see that. So let's go to the next passage, the next, the final paragraph here. This is Numbers chapter 17, verses 8 through 13. Now on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and as it bore ripe, and it bore ripe almonds. Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. 
But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they will not die. Thus Moses did, just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Then the sons of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, we perish, we are dying, we are all dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? All right, this would be kind of pretty hard to fake, wouldn't it? This test that's proposed. Moses goes in the next morning. Aaron's rod had not only sprouted, as God said that it would, it also produced blossoms and ripe almonds. So this is clearly a miracle. This does not happen overnight. This does not happen from a dead walking stick. So this is a sign from God. Everybody saw this. Everybody took their plain old rods home. But God has Moses put Aaron's rod in the Ark of the Covenant as a testimony, as a reminder that the people are not to grumble against the Lord or else they will die. So mission accomplished, message delivered, at least for now. The people react by being terrified that they may die at any moment. And that's right. That's absolutely true. They get it. Uh, this is finally sinking in. They're finally understanding this. They're absolutely, completely, utterly terrified, at least for the moment. Well, the next few chapters, I think, are going to have some additional information concerning what the people need to do to be okay with God. And we'll plan on uh, picking up with that next week. So this brings us to the end of the first 17 chapters of Numbers. And next week, let's pick up with Numbers chapter 18, and we'll hope to cover a few chapters next week. Um, sorry about the low battery warning. If that popped up, I'm assuming that popped up for everybody, but uh, that's the way it happens sometimes. But uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something that we need to be praying about as a church, if there's something we can do to encourage you, let us know. You can send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. And you can also call or send a text to me, 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only almighty God. And we honor you tonight for being our God. We praise you for that. Thank you for the reminder through your servant Moses that grumbling and complaining and that kind of whining spirit is so offensive to you. Tonight we keep this in mind and we pray for humble, honest, obedient hearts. And we pray that you'll give us wisdom and patience as we submit to and support and encourage your appointed leaders as imperfect as they may be. Forgive us when we have murmured and complained in the past. And Father, we ask that you show us a better way through your word. We ask for your blessing tonight on the parents of young children in our congregation, that you would give them the wisdom and strength for the years ahead. We pray also tonight for our seniors. Bless those who are struggling with their health and bless those who are serving as caregivers. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight through Jesus, your son. Amen.